Okay, we're now in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 1. Sorry I haven't been recording for the last two days, but I've been putting up food and having some other things that had to be done. I hope you're all having a blessed day. Anyway, Ezekiel 3, verse 1. The voice said to me, Son of man, eat what I am giving you. Eat the scroll. Then go and give its message to the people of Israel. Two. So I opened my mouth and he fed me the scroll three fill your stomach with this he said and when i ate it it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth and then he said son of man go to the people of israel and give them my messages verse five i am not sending you to a foreign people whose language you cannot understand no i am sending you to a people with strange and difficult speech if i did they would listen I am not sending you to a people with strange and difficult speech. If I did, they would not listen. Seven, but the people of Israel won't listen to you any more than they listen to me, for the whole of whole lot of them are hard-hearted and stubborn. Eight. But look, I have made you as an obstinate and hard and hard-hearted as they are. Nine. I have made your forehead as hard as the hardest rock. So don't be afraid of them or fear their angry looks, even though they are rebels. So in other words, God created Ezekiel from the very beginning to understand these obstinate and hard-hearted because <clears throat> he was hard-hearted with God, obstinate about God, not obstinate against God. Ten. Then he added, Son of man, let all my words sink deep into your own heart first. Listen to them carefully for yourself. So what that uh, means to me is study it yourself, figure it out, understand it, accept it before you can deliver it. You have to know the truth before you can deliver the truth. 11, then go to your people in exile and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Do this whether they listen to you or not. 12. Then the spirit lifted me up and I heard a loud rumbling sound behind me. May the glory of the Lord be praised in this place. Uh, a possible reading for this verse is, Then the spirit lifted me up and as the glory of the Lord rose from its place, I heard a loud rumbling and sound behind me. And that does seem to make more sense. 13. It was the sound of the wings of the living beings as they brushed against each other and the rumbling of their wheels behind them. Now remember, Ezekiel saw a wheel going forward and around. And we ha I didn't read that to you, but you should have already read it. 14, the spirit lifted me up and took me away. I went in bitterness and turmoil, but the Lord, Lord's hold on me was strong. 15, then I came to the colony of Judean exiles in Tel Aviv, beside the Kibar River. I was overwhelmed and sat among them for seven days. Now, does this mean that uh, the Spirit of the Lord actually picked him up? Actually picked him up and took him there, translated him there, lifted him. Now, that's a place where we should study, not just read. And next year, as I'm reading and have studied more myself, I can probably add more to this. A watchman for Israel, verse 16. After seven days, the Lord gave me a message. He said, Son of man, I have appointed you as a watchman for Israel. Whenever you receive a message from me, warn people immediately. Uh, this is like uh, the dream that covers stone had uh if any of you have listened to it you might uh I, I might be able to put that link down uh and you can look for it in the carrot area or i can stick it up on you and him ministries uh so you can go directly to it when you look at the daily manna verses uh but to make it very short as Coverstone was trying to get into a church and being kept being told you're late you're late you're late well the watchmen are late and when he went in, they handed him a scarecrow costume. And so when you're a watchman on the wall, 
It's as if you are coming in to scare the people with the message, the message that the devil's church or the church that um, is sitting with masks and the preacher that's being uh, preaching the doctrine of demons from the pulpit. Uh, I've seen some of these churches and I've seen some of the ministers that they brought in that twist or confuse the congregation that have demons. You don't let a person who has a demon up into the pulpit speak to me. Nonetheless, you will be the scarecrow. You will be the scarecrow. You will be scaring the birds away, the demons. And uh, the emergent church doesn't like that. Uh, the church that doesn't want the Old Testament, they just need the New Testament. They don't like that. They don't want the watchman. 17, son of man, I've appointed you as a watchman for Israel. Whenever you receive a message from me, warn people immediately. So I don't know if I'm a watchman. I'm reading, I'm looking, I'm listening, and I'm seeing. And so I guess I would be in this day and age a scarecrow. Perfectly okay with me if that's what Lord, the Lord has appointed. 18, if I warn the wicked saying you are under the penalty of death, you will fail to deliver the warning. They will die in their sins and I will hold you responsible for their deaths. In other words, the watchman is responsible to give the warning. If they will not give the warning, it will be accountable to them. He's telling Ezekiel, you're under the penalty of death. If you fail to deliver the warning, because they're going to die in their sins, you got to warn them. In other words, you got to tell the people to repent. That means even the ones out in the parking lots who are homeless. They're there for a reason. They're either on drugs or they've sinned or they're not asking for help from God. They're not repenting. There's a reason for homelessness. It isn't just because they don't have any money. They don't have any money because of sin or handling finances uh, badly, not being a good steward over what God, not being grateful to God for what they did have, making deals with bad business, having no discernment. And so if they reach out for help from the church and they're ready to obey uh, people that are Christians and accept the Lord, they'll get their help. 19, if you warn them and they refuse to repent and keep on sinning, they will die in their sins. But you will have saved yourself because you obeyed me. So obey the Lord. Be the watchman. It can't be anything else. Be the watchman. Be the scarecrow amongst the congregation. <laughs> oh, praise God. <laughs> oh, my Lord. 20, if righteous people turn away from their righteous behavior and ignore the obstacles I put in their way, they will die. And if you do not warn them, they will die in their sins. None of the righteous acts will be remembered and I will hold you responsible for their deaths. Um, actually, the Coverstone, um, it's called Halloween Dream. But Coverstone didn't, I don't believe that he interpreted it as well as Stan Johnson did. And I will try to put his link up. Uh, and that, that was given uh, in the Prophecy Club a couple days ago. 21. But if you warn righteous people not to sin and they listen to you and do not sin, they will live and you will have saved yourself too. This message is not just to Ezekiel. This message is for today to us. Just because it's in the Old Testament doesn't mean it's not for us. Then the Lord took hold of me and said, get up and go out into the valley and I will speak to you there. So evidently Ezekiel, he already said, he said he, he was obstinate, just like the people. 23, so I got up and went and there I saw the glory of the Lord. Just as I had seen in my first vision by the Kibar River and I fell face down on the ground. Let's see, I want to see, was Ezekiel... Um, okay, Ezekiel was, um, 
according to the book itself, it records six visions of the prophet Ezekiel exiled in Babylon. So he was exiled. He was in the diaspora during the 22 years from 593 to 571 BCE, although it is the product of a long and complex history and does not necessarily preserve the very words of the prophet. He was in exile 22 years. Wow. So he, he's, he's not just coming from a place of <clears throat> safety, although he's obviously made his home there. Uh, 24. Then the spirit came into me, into me, and set me on my feet. So he wasn't just, the spirit wasn't just coming upon him. He was coming within him. He spoke to me and said, go to your house and sh shut yourself in. 25, there, son of man, you will be tied with rope so you cannot go out among the people. Wow. 26, and I will make your tongue stick to the roof of your mouth so that you will be speechless and unable to rebuke them for they are rebels. 27, but when I give you a message, I will loosen your tongue and let you speak. Then you will say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Those who choose to listen will listen, but those who refuse will refuse for they are rebels. You can see Ezekiel has done some suffering. Okay. So we will go into um, Ezekiel 4. Okay, now we're working with Ezekiel 4, starting with verse 1, a sign of the coming siege. <clears throat> and now, son of man, take a large clay brick and set it down in front of you. Then draw a map of the city of Jerusalem on it. Uh, prophets back in the Old Testament used to uh, have to do physical things. Uh, some of them did pantomime. And like Ezekiel here, he's actually doing something where God is trying to make a point and use it prophetically. Ezekiel 4.2, show the city under siege, build a wall around it so no one can escape. Set up the enemy camp and surround the city with siege ramps and battering rams. Three, then take an iron griddle and place it between you and the city. Turn toward the city and demonstrate how harsh the siege will be against Jerusalem. This will be a warning to the people of Israel. Four, now lie on your left side and place the sins of Israel on yourself. You are to bear their sins for the number of days you lie there on your side. Five, I am requiring you to bear Israel's sins for 390 days, one day for each year of their sin. Wow. Six. After that, turn over and lie on your side, right side for 40 days, one day for each year of Judah's sin. Seven, meanwhile, keep staring at the siege of Jerusalem. Lie there with your arm bared and prophesy her destruction. Eight, I will tie you up with ropes so you won't be able to turn from side to side until the days of your siege have been completed. Oh my goodness sakes. Nine, now go and get some wheat, barley, beans, lentils, millet, and emmer wheat and mix them together in a storage jar. Use them to make bread for yourself during the 390 days you will be lying on your side. Ten, ration this out to yourself, eight ounces or 20 shekels, 228 grams of food for each day and eat it at set times. 11, the measure out, then measure out a jar, one sixth of a hen, about one pint or 0.6 liters of water for each day and drink it at set times. 12, prepare and eat this food as you would barley cakes. While all the people are watching, bake it over a fire using dried human dung as fuel and then eat the bread. Oh my goodness sakes. 13, then the Lord said, this is how Israel will eat defiled bread in the Gentile lands to which I will banish them. 14, 
Then I said, O sovereign Lord, must I be defiled by using human dung? For I have never been defiled before. From the time I was a child until now, I have never eaten any animal that died of sickness or was killed by other animals. I have never eaten any meat forbidden by law. 15. All right, the Lord said, you may bake your bread with cow dung instead of human dung. Wow, is that any better, actually? <laughs> 16. Then he told me, son of man, I will make food very scarce in Jerusalem. It will be weighed out with great care and eaten fearfully. The water will be rationed out drop by drop and the people will drink it with dismay. 17. Lacking food and water, people will look at one another in terror and they will waste away under their judgment. My, 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 my. Well, what's coming to America because of her disobedience, is it going to be any better? Are there not any prophets in this land that will actually tell the truth about what is really going to happen to America? Is there no one that's going to look at the food shortages the uh, diesel shortage or the DEF, is anyone going to be used of the Lord or obey the Lord to tell the truth? We are going into a time of trouble and Israel will most likely be doing the same thing. And it is expressed as a time of travail as uh, when a woman is getting ready to give birth. I'm not looking forward to it. The only thing that I'm going to do personally is I'm going to hang on to the Lord. Um, I got a chance to witness to a young man today who evidently thought he knew it all. He has a brother that is in deep sin, but his brother is, and he's breaking a commandment. I don't want to use the word, but it's a person that uh, is perverted as a man to a man. And he says that his brother is the most wonderful person he knows. And I actually had to tell him, you know, you're telling me that you read the Bible at as an 11-year-old and you understand the Bible. And the church doesn't mean much to you. So... Now, as a watchman, I'm telling you the truth. I'm praying for you that God will direct your path with truth and peace and direction. And you're going to tell me that you know it all. But what I've done at this point as a watchman, because the sin would have been laid at my feet if I hadn't told this young man the truth. I told him the truth. He either wants to accept it or he wants to reject it. However, as the church, I will tell you right now, I believe the church has and is failing God. If you are given an assignment serendipitously and you are meeting a person where you are witnessing to them about the truth, the one God, the only way to heaven is through the Lord Jesus Christ, and they know it all, and they're going to tell you that they read the Bible as 11-year-old, and they're going to tell you they understand it, and they don't believe the whole thing, that there's a misinterpretation. At that point, you tell the person the truth, and instead of you being accountable for that man's life and sin because they're not saved, it is at that point passed on to them and they are responsible for their own sin and their own decision. I told my pastor today that I uh, was putting on the scarecrow suit or costume because the scarecrow and David, Dan, um, Dana Coverstone's dream actually represented the watchman. I don't believe my pastor understood what I was talking about because he hadn't heard or maybe even read the dream that Dana Coverstone had. I may get the opportunity to tell him down the line. I don't know. I 
have offended many pastors, not intentionally, but because I believe the Lord gave me a word for them, and they were offended. But this is what, what the watchman does. You tell them the truth. You tell them what you believe God has spoken to you. You release it. And at that point, you are no longer accountable for that word. They can either listen to it or not listen to it. They can go ahead and make fun of you. They can laugh at you. I'm not saying my pastor laughs at me or makes fun of me. Uh it, uh, he evidently didn't know the whole story and looked at me kind of funny. I hopefully will be able to tell the story again when we go to prayer meeting on Wednesday night if I have the opportunity. But I believe that this dream that Coverstone had is one of the most important dreams that he has had. The people that are wearing masks in the church and look at Ezekiel, what he had to go through. Is there a Christian today that is willing to lay on their side for 390 days? I don't think so. And so, but we can't even open our mouth and witness to a person, even when they're shoving us away and telling us that we're wrong. I believe if we do not tell them the truth, as the watchman God is calling the church to be, we will be accountable for that person's sin. You might want to think about this. Anyway, we're going to go. To... It's Sunday. It's late. I've been trying to get to this all day. You won't get it till tomorrow because you, most of you people are getting ready to go to bed. And I have to deliver a message at 10 o'clock tonight. And I'm going to stay awake. And then when I get back home, I'm going to go to bed and go to sleep. Anyway, I am Pam Gunderson, host of You and Him Ministries, Bible Study and Christian Prophetic News. Let's go ahead and go on. Uh, we're now going into Psalms. Okay, so we're in Psalm 119. I'm having to do this piecemeal. I uh, started it this morning before I went to church. Uh, so it's Psalm 161 to 168. And that's Psalm 119, verses 161 to 168. And we are in the New Living Translation. Powerful people har harass me without cause, but my heart trembles only at your word. So Shin, let's find out what letter. Oh, I actually took, I took down my Hebrew. I took down my Hebrew. Uh, keyboard let's go in here shin is the what letter of the hebrew alphabet shin is the 21st letter so this is the 21st section of psalm 119 Verse 162, I rejoice in your word like one who discovers a great treasure. Lord, let me rejoice in your word like one who discovers a great treasure. You can actually pray these things through. Uh, there are some psalms that are imprecatory. Um, we'll deal with that later. My tremble, let my heart tremble only at your word. That is in verse 161. 163, I hate and abhor all falsehood, but I love your instructions. Dear Lord, I love your instructions. Six, 164, I will praise you seven times a day because all your regulations are just. Lord, let me remember to praise you at least seven times a day because all your regulations are just. 165, 
those who love your instructions have great peace and do not stumble. That is 119, 165. I've learned it this way. Great peace of those who love their word and nothing shall cause them to stumble or falter or fall. 166. I long for your rescue, Lord, so I have obeyed your commands. Lord, I long for your rescue, so I have obeyed your commands. 167. I have obeyed your laws, for I love them very much. Lord God, I love your laws. I love them very much. I obey them. 168. Yes, I obey your commandments and laws because you know everything I do. Boy, do you know everything I do, Lord. You know my heart. It may not even come out of my mouth, but you know my heart better than I do. If I look at my heart, Lord, if I look at my heart, Lord, it dismays me that it could be so wicked. And I don't intend it. But the thought life the enemy brings to me, the thought life that the enemy wishes me to have is abhorrent. It touches me, Lord. Let me not take it on, even though it tries to touch me, Lord. I pray for each and every person here in this place. Though this lasts a generation, Lord, that somebody comes in in the last of the last of the last days, that they will pay attention to this. In Jesus' name. Okay, now we're in uh, Proverbs 28, 13. Okay. People who conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. Lord God, let us receive mercy. Let us turn from our sin. Let us confess our sin, those known and unknown, that we will obtain mercy from you, Lord. Lord, we ask for your mercy, your compassion. We lift up the United States. We ask for your mercy, but Lord, we have sinned. America has sinned and is continually going to sin. They don't know the truth. They do not live the truth. They lie continually. Who can know it? Hebrews 2, 1 through 18. Okay. A warning against drifting away. Hebrews 2, 1. So we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may drift away from it. I'm just going to read this as a letter, okay? For the message of God delivered through angels has always stood firm, and every violation of the law and every act of disobedience was punished. So what makes us think we can escape if we ignore this great salvation that was first announced by the Lord Jesus himself and then delivered to us by those who heard him speak? And God confirmed the message by giving signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit whenever he chose. Jesus the man. And this is uh, also in Psalm 8, verses 1 through 9. I'm going to read uh, Psalm 8, verses 1 through 9, before I read uh, Hebrews 2, 5. <clears throat> o Lord, our God, O Lord, O Lord, your, maj how, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silence, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. When I took, when I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, 
Okay, come back. Okay. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. Yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority, the flocks and the herds and all the wild animals. So why do you think it is that Satan hates us the way he does? And do not be deceived. The devil hates God's creation because when he looks at us, he sees God. Not that we are God, but we are in the image of God. And so when he looks at us, he doesn't want to look at God's creation or anything in the image of God. So he must wipe it out. If he can't kill you one way, he'll kill you another. He'll try to kill your soul. He'll try to kill anybody around you so that you will not have the joy of the Lord. Why do you think people are starting to change their genders? Because what God created, he wants to change. Why do people want to have facelifts? Because they don't like what it is that God gave them. Um, just a number of things. Why do you think a man wants to have a baby? Why do you think a man wants to um, have breasts? Because the enemy is giving that information to the person and making them uncontent with what they are and who they are. Anything to change the image of God in that person. To distort their minds, to distort their view of themselves. That's what's going on. That is what's going on. So let's go back and finish reading. Hebrews 2, 5. And furthermore, it is not angels who will control the future world we are talking about. For in one place, the scriptures say, what are mere mortals that you should think about them or a son of man that you should care for him? Yet you made them only a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them authority over all things. Now when it says all things, it means nothing is left out, but we have not yet seen the things put under their authority. It says that we will be priests and kings. Is that all of us? I don't know. Is there different ranks when we leave this world to live in the next? I don't know. What we do see is Jesus, who was given a position a little lower than the angels. And because he suffered death for us, he is now crowned with glory and honor. Yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone. God, for whom and through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children into glory, and it was only right that he should make Jesus, through his suffering, a perfect leader, fit to bring them into their salvation. So now Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. For he said to God, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters, I will praise you among your assembled people. And that's in Psalms 22, 22. He also said, I will put my trust in him. That is, I am the children of God has, and the children God has given me. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood. 
the son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil, who had the power of death. He took those keys of death away from him, though. Says he had. Only in his way could he set, only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. We also know that the son did not come to help angels. He came to help the descendants of Abraham. 17, therefore, it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us. His brothers and sisters. Uh, now, they've added sisters in the manuscript. It's just brothers. However, um, women are included as well so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God, then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. Since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. Um, I want to read Hebrew 2.17 in the New King James, or the King James Version, I'm curious. Okay. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So it says his brethren. And I guess there's some people that would not want to include women. Um. I don't know why it's written that way and why it didn't say sisters and brothers. One of the many questions we'll have to ask when we see them. Um, a lot of people accuse Paul of not wanting uh, women to preach or teach. Uh, he would not suffer a woman to, to the, do this or do that or whatever. However, what do we do with Priscilla and Aquila? What do we do with Lydia? Uh, what, we do, what, what do we do with Mar Mary and Martha? So you have to realize, though, that Paul was definitely a Hasidic Jew, uh, a rabbi. Why did God pick him? He did seem to have a problem. In the way that he writes, he seems to... Um, but no, he met Lydia. He's not excluding women. But in the way that... Um, I guess the one story that would make sense is Mozart had a sister. And from, from what I understand, his sister was every bit the composer and pianist or harpsichordist that Mozart was. But because she was a woman, she was not paraded around and given the same um, accolades that Mozart was. Because he was a boy. And boys meant more. It's just true. Uh even queens, the husband of the queen, the king, still was the one with the last word. I mean, look at Henry VIII, how many of his wives he killed. They weren't going around killing anybody. We had Bloody Mary uh, over in uh, Scotland, I believe it was. But uh, she was not the norm. And then we had Queen Elizabeth, who I don't believe she had uh, the right to kill anybody. So who knows? I, d I just know that God loves uh, us equally. Um, there is a scripture that says there is no male or female, da 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 da, that we're all the same. However, 
when Jesus comes back, he's going to rule from the throne of David. He's not ruling from the throne of Bathsheba. So there you go. Anyway, it's been a long day. Uh, I'm obviously not fully up to par, so I'm going to go ahead and discontinue this reading. We have done uh, the reading for Sunday, the 6th of November, and I will put that up. You can, uh, not everybody's getting to all the scriptures the same day anyway, so uh, feel free to read as God uh, would have you read. Anyway, God bless you. Please be saved, healed, and delivered, and I will see you one way or another on the 7th. I'll either be reading, but you will see daily the daily manna, and I'm still getting ready to do the next, uh, it's, uh, it's, um, it'll be Acts 15, starting with the verse 16, and we're still working with Demetru Dudeman. Anyway, God bless. I'll see you next time.